Welcome back to the General Tire Jim Beaver Show with Good Times by Kawasaki. Uh, I'd like to welcome my good friend Mark Gomez. Uh, I guess a guy that's just a complete badass on a jet ski. What's happening, Mark? Hey, what's happening, Jim? Thank you for having me. No, I know we've talked about it for a better part of a year now since we did that Cali ride uh, uh, on the three tens uh, up to uh, to Pirates and back and things like that. But it's fun to finally catch up. No, we just had a little bit of fun at the Run What You Brung this past weekend. So yeah, we met up at Pirates Den, um, the big Run What You Brung Poker Run. Um, it's a massive event with zero cell phone service. So it's a big deal that no one hears about, which is actually kind of cool in its own sense because it is just a simply a boatload of stand-ups on the river and everyone's just blasting around it used to be a poker run i don't think it was like that this year um but just endless endless amounts of stand-ups and all kinds of things uh blasting up and down the river and uh nothing but good times there yeah well here's a question for you you know because we talked about the massive amount of people that showed up for this and like i, I was on the river on thursday through sunday and I mean, starting about Thursday, there was just a ton of ton of skis. Uh, you know, there was all kinds of stuff. To be honest with you, um, even saw um, what was the what was the Cowie the Jetmate. I even saw a Jetmate on Thursday. Yeah, and I was like, yes, yes. Uh, dude, it was definitely run what you brung. But you know, that being said, there's a ton of stand ups. I feel like, and and obviously, I've been around. You know, growing up in Parker, I've been around jet skis my entire life. Um, but I feel like. Right now, jet skiing, you know, especially the stand-ups, has seen a big resurgence, man. Uh, I feel like it's it's riding a wave. I mean, I, you, you've been around for a long time. What do you what do you think? You know, I think it has uh, as bad as COVID was for everything, and I don't give it a hall pass whatsoever. I think what it did do is it got a lot of people in that time frame where about summer 2020 hit, and people are like, hey, I got some stimulus bucks. Um, I've got either nostalgia or just stand-ups look awesome right now. Everybody's looking for something to do and something to spend 500 bucks on a week. And what is better than that than a vintage jet ski you could pick up for anywhere from 500 bucks to, uh, well, now they're all out of that range. But, you know, it was, it was, ent it became entry level. So the point where all the skis that your dad or your parents or whatever you grew up riding, now you kind of became in that price range to pick it back up. And then what else do you have to do with your time? But order products online and put them back together and go hit the river with your buddies. So I did see quite a resurgence of standups and not just people going for specific competitions or things, just general recreation, which gets me super excited because that's my grassroots. It's all of our grassroots. Yeah. Well, and I think too, one of the cool things you look back at like the eighties, stuff like that, there's so many like old five fifties and six fifties laying around that you can get for next to nothing. You know, and it's like, there's still a lot of parts available for them, things like that. And I think that's just cool. Yeah. yeah. You see the brand new SXRs and, and things like that and the price point, but it's like, you can get into a vintage ski. That's still a whole lot of fun to ride for not very much money at all. You can, you can get into it now getting them running. Yeah. Oh, that's it's, it's, it's it's been a rough reality call for a couple of people. I, I do still on it from time to time. I worked at a jet ski shop for 10 years in Brea, California, and I worked on nothing pretty much but 550s and 440s, specific motorsports in Brea, California. And my boss, Gordy, um, had bought a lot of inventory of PJS stuff when they had gone under. Now, PJS was performance jet ski. They're like the bee's knees at the time. They made all the aftermarket stuff for these skis. So had a ple had a plethora have access to tons of parts use new um sort of speak um it's really interesting to see how things have changed now um where stuff is it depends on what you're looking for but dime a dozen still i mean i've seen people dropping two three thousand dollars into these things uh when it's all said and done but then again too you've got just as good of a jet ski um they all need love every once in a while and the things are now 30 years old yeah, it's well, and I know, like, I mean, we can just go through the, the like the vintage stuff, but I mean, even uh, like looking at uh, you know the the super chickens, you know, and you've got one of the most iconic ones, I think, uh, on social media <laughs> right now. But it's like I bought one here about a year ago, and I'm like, the offers I've had on this thing, I'm like, I I'm just having it gone through right now, and I've got yeah, I, I flip it, and make fifteen hundred bucks. You know, it's crazy, like the probably. So, Probably, but then probably. you're not going to have the good times of being on. You're not going to wake up that Sunday morning and be like, where the heck was I last yesterday? Oh, I was out riding a super chicken because my, my C3 and my C5 are destroyed. 
Um, I saw something uh, the other day on the internet. I want to ask you before we got a lot to talk about today. Oh, yeah. talked about vintage jet skis or something. I think it was a Yamaha, but it was like called the flying saucer or something like that. And it looked like a big Frisbee. It looked like uh, a UFO. You know, I've yeah. seen that, but I never had any experience with one of those. I was just, I'll tell you what, I just was as surprised as you were when I saw that online. I was like, they made, if they made a super, Kawasaki went and made a super chicken production wise. They made anything that would float and put a jet pump in it, I think, back in the 80s, 90s. Yeah, I was looking at that. I was like, that saucer, there, somebody's like, oh, yeah, there's only like 100 of them in existence or something like that. I'm like, I'm surprised there's that many of them. <laughs> I was like, one of those ever comes across, I might actually just buy it just to have yeah. because yeah. it looks that bizarre. But, you know, talking about, you know, jet ski industry, stuff like that, how, how did you get your start, you know what I mean, in, in, you know, in jet skiing? Because, uh, um, it's one of those where it's just, uh, you know, it's, you had to have grown up around it, grown up around the water. I mean, how did, how did you get into it? So I had a, um, my dad at uh, growing up seven and a half, um, had a Kawasaki, uh, 550, the iconic, um, red graphic with blue scallops on it. Um, it was like a mid eighties, 550 and 86. Um, and the, the, the biggest thing was is that was always in our front driveway just on a trailer it didn't really didn't see it too many times at the uh lake because that was always like one summer trip a year however that jet ski was in the front yard all the time and what i had access to was a vhs called jet dreams which was at the time the i wouldn't say the uh crusty demons of jet skiing but it was a cinematic honestly radical video writing video from the top four legends of the sport at the time which is larry rip and kroger harry gocher chris fischetti and scott watkins now scott watkins was writing a, the other guys all had custom painted 550s at the time um but watkins had like the sleeper r and r tech 550 that was the same exact look same body style as the one that my dad had in the front driveway so as a very impressionable young kid I'm watching this movie over and over and over again, just obsessed with how cool it is. These guys are going under the water. Um, first time that kind of stuff had been shot for jet skiing. So it was like really the colors were awesome. It's a little bit hard to swallow now when you look back because of our 30 second attention span. But, um, you know, high shorts, 80s, fluoro, everything. And but it is really shot ahead of its time. Um, so you're watching that as a, I'm watching that as a kid. And that jet ski again is in my front driveway. I can go, I can hit the start button. Nothing would happen because the battery was long dead. Um, I could just hop in the tray and pick up the handle pole. Like to me, that dream was just outside the door. So that kind of was enough to keep me just something in the back of my mind. It was just something I always wanted to do. Um, and it never really grew into something until uh, just again, little river trips, little family trips, like nothing yeah. special. I was never in any races whatsoever, but it did give me a decent little base of writing um to where the point when i was in high school a friend of ours fixed that jet ski up um my brother and i had some sp sporadic interest to go ride it again and uh saw that we could ride was like hey you need to come out to oceanside we went out to oceanside and poof, brain blew up and that was when i knew and i not only rode surf and was mind blown but also then at the same time met some of the most iconic pro free rider guys at the time that were doing insane tricks and they were super open and really cool guys to that was like something clicker was like this is what i want to do and here i am uh, i remember uh gosh when uh you know as a kid growing up here in parker and it was kind of wild because you know you i i was lucky the river was at my doorstep you know so you go out there and you can see all kinds of stuff but what really yeah. like got me was uh watching it on espn for the first time and you know, seeing the tires and, you know, the guys jumping over the tires and under them yeah. and stuff like that. I was just like, that's actually possible on a jet ski. How is this even happening? You know? Yeah. Uh, log was like, log jumps are sick. Yeah. So it was just one of those. That's what really kind of got me hooked into reading, watching like anything I could at the point, that point in time. And you talk about like the videos, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's funny because, you know, back then there was no YouTube, there was no social media. So it was like, you know, to consume the content, it was really tough. I remember I used to have a VCR in the living room and I had a tape in there that was blank. And like anytime the jet ski races would come on, I'd run in there and push record. That way I could go and watch them again. You know what That's I mean? That's rad. 
yeah, yeah. You know, once, once they were over and things like that. So it's like, I don't know, kids nowadays, I, I hate to age myself, but it's like, man, it's like, I remember how, how hard it was to consume any kind of content that you wanted because it was just like, it was so rare to catch it, especially on mainstream TV or something. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is I never really saw it on mainstream TV. I think I just a couple of times, but I borderline took it for granted because there was never really unfortunately I never followed it like I wanted to follow it until like I was in high school. So this was like 2006, 2007. Um, and at the time, coverage of events was dwindling. Um, come to find out because, yeah, I couldn't really find it. I remember just Googling at school just on the computer going professional jet skier and uh, Mark Sickerling from Germany, a pro freestyle jet skier pops up like he had a website and it was all in the German, but I had tons of a couple pictures and I was like, cool, that's my guy. I don't know him, but I like this guy. And um, uh, long story short, down the road, we end up, he's one of my judges at um, one of the surf comps and we are good friends. We've ridden waves and we're, you know, it's still maintain a friendship to this day. So it's pretty cool. Um, however, the online forums for jet skiing was the thing that really roped me in. There's a website called x-h2o.com. And that was like, I was on that more than I was on like a Facebook or a AIM or a, I mean, I was going on this website. This is before all the schools got like crafty to like threat, uh, what do you call them? Forums. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, screw internet research, screw like doing my book report. Like I'm just you know, on my zero period or whatever, like class I was in, just looking up what people were doing, what builds people were doing, what parts were happening. It was just like crazy how much time I spent on just looking at consuming that kind of content. Yeah. And, and I think it was the same with me on and off road stuff, like the forums, like that point in time, like it was race desert, things like that. But it's like, hmm. I, I, I would jump on there, you know, and my dad off-road raced. And so it was just like, literally, I was consuming, even before I started racing, just as much content as I could, like yeah. on builds and suspension and things like that. Like, it was just, that was me, same thing, you know, and I didn't have a computer at home that had internet. So it's like at mm -hmm. school, it was like, you know what I mean? I was locked in the, the library every chance, <laughs> get, you know, just on there, yeah. like, just printing stuff out, things like that. It was nuts. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. And following people's threads, having a certain, like, I remember, like, remembering threads that I would be so interested in and I have to go like search to find it or it pop up on the top of the thread because you're like, ooh, somebody's talking smack in that one or somebody's posted up an update. Like it wasn't nearly as toxic as the internet is nowadays, but oh. um, there just definitely was a, a, a bit of a bit of tea back then as well. But it was yeah, tasteful, just, tasteful tea. Yeah. And that's what's funny. Like, and I didn't have internet at home. So it's like, I'd post something and if it was right at the end of the period, I wouldn't be able to check it until the next day. So it was like, yeah. oh, we're <laughs> 24 hours you later, you go, you're sorting through 30 replies, you know? Yeah. But it, with that, that was it though. It was like, even though we had a cell phone, there wasn't that instant gratification of like, oh, you know, next time I sneeze or I take a drink of water or I, um, you know, go take a poo. I'm going to go check that comment and see if anybody got back in there. Like, no, this is the next day. Like, you know, it wasn't going anywhere. Yeah, I remember the first uh, uh, cell phone I saw. And they're like, oh, this one's got a camera. I'm like, why would anybody ever want a camera on their cell phone? You yeah, know, why I would remember? anybody want to look like Super Mario, like yeah. Super <laughs> Nintendo Mario on, yeah. on a cell phone? <laughs> it was like the worst photo ever. And I'm like, why would you want this? And what are you going to do with it? Yeah. yeah. Like, now, fast forward and we don't. You know, we live off this thing and make a living off of our phones, you know? Yeah, no kidding. Um, oh, man. But back to jet skis, um, that's cool. You know, that's interesting that you got to grow up in Parker because there's so much history um, with Clayton Jacobson that I never really got super invested with. I'll, I'll let in my, you know, I'll, I'll get some haggle for this. But, you know, I never really thoroughly read through Clayton's book or had, um, I, I need to buy it. And I'm just... Yeah, it's one of those things you're like, oh, I'll get time and I'll have downtime to read it later. But like, no, I, I need to I need to invest in that because it's such a cool, unique story, especially when you go there and the the um, the, their legacy is still there in Parker. So it's pretty unique. Yeah, there's well, and that's what's, you know, growing up in Parker, like, you know, you mentioned Clayton Jacobson and, you know, and uh, kind of the original jet skis, things like that. But I remember a lot of things like, um, you know, I used to go. uh I, you know, from the time I was about three or four, I started taking water ski lessons and I got pretty competitive in water skiing. And then 
um, before wakeboarding, long before wakeboarding, there were scurf boards. And I remember having a oh, boy. scurf board, you know, and things like that. And I'm just like, you know, so I, you know, air chair, I remember the first time I saw an air chair when they were still had prototypes, and they were park in Parker testing the air chair. And I'm like, what the hell is yeah, this? Yeah, let's, let's sit on a stainless steel knife and fly through the air. What could go wrong? Yeah. And yeah. I, yeah, the funny thing is, is still to this day, I've never ridden ridden an air chair. Like there was, yeah, just, they, I I've no, watched, no I've interest. watched too many people just yard sale themselves on those, and I'm like, yeah, yeah I have zero interest in an air chair whatsoever. Nah. I've got an Armstrong foil from TC, and that that thing's rad, and that's fun because it's like surfing speed, and yeah. you can get yourself into trouble. But flying, I mean, I don't like my wife. God bless her. She's wakeboarding, and she watching her fly through the air at. 26 then getting whipped and probably hitting the wave at i don't know high 20s mid 30 like on the whip trajectory to hit this little wake on a t on an edge and it's like dude i want nothing to do with it there was a time in my life where i liked jumping wake to wake but now with unfortunately like it's just i'm all in on jet skiing and i've had two injuries last year that just totally set me back and it's just like puts things into perspective more so that it's like okay i really am all in on this so unfortunately, you don't have the greatest. Um, if you're not writing, you're not making an income. <laughs> Let's yeah. put it that way. Well, and I think you know, we're going to jump around just because you kind of segued into it. But I know, like, yeah. let's talk about that injury last year and things like that. Because I know you and I, we, we hung out in September and it was right before mm -hmm. World Finals. And you were really training hard for World Finals. I mean, you were like, this is, you know, this is my world championship. I'm, I'm going to win this this year. And then you ended up having, I think it was a knee problem, right? And you ended up having to withdraw from World Finals. Oh, yeah, it was super lame. And yeah, thank you. So last year was going for it. You know, I moved my wife and I got married in Lake Havasu moved here to Lake Havasu. Um, we I was surf. I grew up all those uh, first 10 years of my career out of high school, um, mainly pursued free ride, which is surf riding. Um, there's three aspects of jet skiing um, four ish, but uh, competitively uh, free ride, which is freestyle motocross and surfing combined to make its own unique surf riding experience. Uh, that's free ride. You've got freestyle, which is at the races, which is a two minute routine, which was like hood tricks, stuff that you can, which everybody could really do for the most part, if you spend enough time on a recreational stand up. Um, that evolution went super nuts. We've got aftermarket holes now, uh, carbon fiber, big engines, big pumps, and these things are just, it's all about getting up in the air and staying in the air as much as possible. Um, then you've got racing, which straight, pretty straightforward, closed course racing, um, can take place river lakes, motor surf racing. Um, and then you got your rec riding. Um, so that's all those categories. I got involved specifically in free ride. Then, uh, as I did the world tour translated over to, uh, Lake Havasu, cause that is every single year found myself here competing in racing and freestyle. Um, so I doubled down, my wife moved here. And fast forward to last year, training uh, yet again, another world finals in October, going for it, getting ready. And I'm, we just had bought a house. I'm working in my backyard. I take a knee, um, just stapling something silly in my backyard, like on a piece of AstroTurf that was laid over gravel, thinking no big deal about it. Somehow it had just a rock underneath had just hit the right point of my kneecap. And at first the fluid sac lining in between your kneecap and your knee ligaments, which is called the bursa. So that thing pops like an egg yolk and explodes. All of a sudden I'm looking, I thought I like maybe took a knee on a B or something. Cause my knee was just all of a sudden like super swollen. There was no like ouch moment. It just, why is my knee look like a bowling ball? Um, that basically turned into like a day, day and a half. Then I was like immobilized. I couldn't move. So went over the orthopedic, Hey, what's going on? Okay. Yeah. You've got a blown bursa. Um, let's get the fluid out. I'm like, doctor, I got to go. I'm, I need to be riding yesterday. So he extracts the fluid, cortisone shot. Next morning, I'm like ready to go. I feel like Superman. I got mobility back. It's a little swollen, but not as bad. I give it a day. Next day, I'm like, okay, I'm good. Let's go. I got to go training. Hit Body Beach. I'm doing some what I do, and I'm jumping, compacting, trying to test my ski and all that. And what I think what happened at the end of the day was – lake water got into that incision wound because they use a thicker needle than your average incision or whatever to extract that fluid. And I don't think it healed all the way. So what happened was body beach water got in there. Long story short, it turned septic in about a week. Um, didn't quite go septic. It, it turned into staph infection. 
because I just thought it got it swollen again. Um, I rode it all the way until like the week prior to world finals thinking uh, this is going to go away. I built a freaking cold plunge because I'm like, I got to get my inflammation down. Like I went all at it mentally. I was just like, I am not going to give up on finals. And damn it. Um, I went in and there was a v little viral video on my Instagram that most people still get mad at me about and tell me that they ruined their dinners and stuff where <laughs> the guy's like squeezing the goo out of my kneecap and it looked like a milk latte. And, uh, yeah, I had to go into surgery and they had to clean all that out. So, um, yeah, long story short, that was a crappy injury. A couple months prior to that, I had a really bad ankle sprain on the same leg. Um, just that had, then I rode on it all throughout Huntington beach cause it happened two days prior. Um, so between the ankle sprain, recovering from that, doing physical therapy, and then to have that hiccup right before world finals was just like two back to back, just like. Well, I promise I'm going to be better next week. Well, I promise I'm going to be healthy next month. So keeping the mental mindset through all that was, uh, this was a, that was a rough go. That was a, that was a pretty rough year last year. <laughs> Gosh, you know, and I mean, that's, uh, got to reinvigorate you for this year though. Right. I mean, you, you got to feel like there's some unfinished business. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You know, and I, there's all kinds of other hurdles that are happening this year. It's, it's been an interesting year to say the least. Um, but, uh, no, I, I got good people in my corner. Um, I got on some supplements, taking some first form supplements, getting uh, a friend of mine, got me on a good training regimen, um, been active, been taking care of my body, been, uh, working as hard as I can and then getting to the water and just simply getting time on the water and testing parts. So yeah, uh, I'm coming for it. I'm going to be giving it a solid go. Um, Part of what's happening, though, too, is I've transitioned a bit, uh, not just as dedicated to competition, um, to kind of supplement my whole income and bring up more events to bring my sponsors to, as I'm actually doing uh, private shows now. So um, always kind of bit it, but it's kind of gotten more momentum. And this year, I locked in a uh, big show that's coming up with uh, Mid-America Outdoors. That's uh, be going to Oklahoma here soon. Well, I think too, like, you know, we got, like I said, we're going to be bouncing around a bit, but you know, you talk about that and I think you and I are kind of one in the same and that we've figured out how to carve out a living in these niche industries, you know, and it's not, it's not an easy thing, you know, and a lot of people no. think, oh, you know, it's even when you do get a paying sponsor, people think, oh, it's these hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, Mark, <laughs> Mark, Mark's getting these six figures, Jim's getting these six figures, man, yeah. you know, they're living the dream. I'm like, no, we're living the dream, but let me tell you, it's not six figure checks. You know, when, when I get yeah. a four figure check, I'm excited. You know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing. So I think, you know, obviously the competition stuff, but you know, social media, the shows, like it all goes hand in hand. Like you've got to be grabbing from three or four different cookie jars that at the end of the day end up paying the mortgage and, uh, you know, buying the groceries, right? That that's absolutely it. And, uh, you know, look, uh, yes, my main complaint is I don't have enough money to go jet skiing sometimes. And it's, uh, that's my reality, but that is the reality I chose to do. And it excites a lot of people that follow me. And, um, that's just the path least chosen. You know, a lot of people are like, well, you need a job to support your hobby. It's like this between, I, I am in a spot where I've just put in tons of years of work and I've got a lot of great partners that have backed me up for years to allow me to, uh, enabled me to do this, but that is a very heavy task because, um, well, I've spread myself thin, Jim, I, I, I enjoy <laughs> what I, I thoroughly enjoy what I do. So I don't just have one jet ski. I've got, um, oh my gosh, that I honestly don't keep track of how many I have, but I probably in the ballpark range of about six to eight, um, that are all need their love and maintenance from time to time. Um, two of them specifically, these little flat water guys, they consume a lot of parts and time because I'm very rough on them and have sky high expectations and the parts aren't cheap. You know, I do get a lot of help from sponsors, but at the end of the day, I run a small business for doing shows. So instead of holding my hand out, waiting for something to come, um, I'm just ordering from my distributor and I'm getting what I need, getting back on the water as soon as possible, because there is value in just getting back on the water and, um, being as useful and as uh, dangerous of a commodity out there as possible. Well, I know you, you know, we were talking at, at one point, one of our conversations, you know, but like relocating to Havasu, that was a pretty big step, right? I mean, that was kind of an all in like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to try and make a go at this thing. Right. I mean, it's, you know, moving out to Havasu, obviously it's, you know, kind of one of the jet ski capitals of the world, but at the end of the day, it's also a little bit more remote. 
Yeah, it's a uh, it's an island out here. It definitely is. Um, you know, especially taking a not turning my back in any shape or form. But I mean, yeah, I'll face it. Like ever since I moved out here, I can probably count on my hand, both hands, maybe the amount of times I've been back to Oceanside um, or like a Pismo trip. Like it's it's definitely tore my heart a little bit to be this far away from free ride because that was just um, it is definitely the thing I enjoyed the most to this day. Um, unfortunately, just wasn't able to sustain the life that I had come to grown. Um, but yeah, that being said, like it, going to Havasu, that was kind of backed by like a thought with, um, I had a conversation with Levi Lavalley. Um, I love Levi. Really Levi good is player. a great guy. At the time, we were sponsored by Mystic Oil. Um and we were just sitting down at a dinner and I was talking to him. He's got the foam pit in his backyard. I mean, he's got the, com he built the compound and I'm like, man, like, you know, to build that foam pit, like that was a big venture. He's like, you know what? There's a time in my life where, and I'm paraphrasing here, but Levi is a great guy. He just said it very, very point blank. He's like, you know, there's a time where you realize you really love what you do and you just got to double down, man. And I doubled down. We just like, Hey, got to be in Havasu. Havasu is a great place to, my sponsor, some of my sponsors are out there. You got access to the water. I can go test. I can build a, our foundation of our life. So that was it. It was like, okay, double down. I don't have really a foam pit, but just, you know, that's the thing in SoCal. I laugh one with a buddy because it's like living in like Fullerton where uh, that was my hometown. <laughs> I was laughing with a buddy who still kind of lives in, a, in around that area. And he's like, you know, one of the things about being in Havasu is like, you ever just want to like, you're working on your stand up, you just want to go water test it real quick. And he just starts laughing because it's like, you can't everywhere you go in like California to go just at least water test the jet ski and do something semi mischievous. Um, everybody hates you there. Uh, having a jet ski, like you can't go there and do anything fun. You got to go around in a circle, you've got to obey by all these laws, like, in granted, you got to expert maintain the laws, but you can't just go dive into a spot, test your ski real quick, and go back home. Like, that's the freedom you get here in Havasu, and which is really nice. Yeah, that's the same thing with me and Parker. People are like, why are you in Parker? And I'm like, ah, it's not too bad if I need to get SoCal, Phoenix, Vegas. But I'm like, more importantly, like I, I'm right on the river, and I've got the desert right there. Like if I need to test a UTV, go out, film some content, I literally, it's street legal. Just leave my house and drive. Yeah, drive that's awesome. There, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, be out there in five minutes filming, come back. You know, it's the same thing with a jet ski. Like I can hook up to the truck and have it in the water in less than 10 minutes. You know, yeah. it's one of those where it's like anything I want, it's right there. And I'm like, it's an oasis if you're into power sports. Like it truly is, you know. Had you ever um had you ever raced, Jim? Uh stand ups what? or no, 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 no. no. Um I'm no. Um <laughs> well <laughs> Bobby Kearns was trying to convince me to race a Not super yet. last year in the world finals. So okay, Bobby, okay. He's currently going through my super chicken of last year. Literally, I dropped <laughs> it off with him like um it was like the middle to end of September. Bobby goes, I can have this thing turned around and we can race it in the world finals. Yeah. <laughs> like, Calm down, Bobby. He's like, no, dude, let's do it. And I'm like, ah, so yeah. I've made it a point at some point. Like I want to race a stand up. I want to, I've never raced, I've ridden dirt bikes my whole life and I've never raced a dirt bike. And yep. I'm like, I'm 42. And I'm like, it would be awesome someday to actually say I won uh, you know, a desert race, I've won a jet ski race and I've won a dirt bike race. Like how many people have ever said they've won all three, you know? And it's like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I, it's I think a weird thing in the back of my mind where I'm like, oh, that'd be fun at some point. Didn't, uh, I, I want to say, um, Sarah Newton Price just got a, yeah, I was going to uh, say Sarah's won dirt bike and UTV races. So I don't know okay. anyone that's ever won a jet ski race though. Well, but she just got into a stand up, which is pretty cool to see. Um, yeah, I know she must go riding. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. My my wife's been talking to her a little bit. It's good. It's good to see uh, everybody trying to get involved now because it's just it, it is fun. Um, arguably, I think it's you you run the risk of you know close course racing of like other people. You know, there are incidents where people have collided. You know, racing's racing. However, just the general barrier to entry as far as like just practicing when you go into a turn wide open and you whoopsie poopsie and you blow the buoy and you um, wad and you come off the the ski you're alive you get to swim back to the ski you get back on you try again i mean unfortunately like with motocross and other things i mean way gnarlier but at least you're like oh uh instead of like just off the bike you're like i'm in the hospital for a month month and a half or whoever knows how long it's uh it's just the barrier to entry that way is just more fun so i'd like to see more people get involved 
and it's cool to see some of the yes these local races like what um deegan uh newton is doing with uh the uh um sorry what his his tour is uh, uh full throttle water cross yeah full throttle water x um uh, that's a great great event if you guys are looking for races jet jam series and uh like havasu those are good as well um but super super open to beginners um and they're just fun it's just good good classic racing you got any questions hit them up um you know the, a lot of the people in the sport are really cool that's the thing about having a small niche industry is uh myself a couple of the pros like um just general like shops and whatnot like can i reach out to people they're a resource you know and you help them out a little bit do a little commerce with them uh take a lesson with me or you know buy some parts from taylor curtis and these guys are going to open the door for you to like help you get you everything you need to have a great race weekend be safe have your ski handling effectively and go have a great time yeah well i think that's one thing everybody in the jet ski community has been so welcoming like i've kind of just come back to it and Mm -hmm. uh it's uh, it's pretty. Oh, rad. we always love you, Jimmy. You can come back anytime. <laughs> no, but it, no, it was just like even being there at uh, you know, uh, run what you brung this weekend. Like I had so many people start following me on Instagram, and I followed them back. You know, in the dialogue and things like that, people sending me DMs, and um, you know, it's been pretty cool. It's such a welcoming community. It's kind of a breath of fresh air because there's other places that are very elitist and like, you know, some of the other industries I work in, and I'm like, jet skiing is so not that way at all, and I think I love it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It gets, it gets a weird rap sometimes where people, um, Oh God, the internet's so difficult right now is, you know, you don't reply to somebody's comment or somebody's message or, you don't give them the exact information they want at that that time. They might say something. And then there's like a little cesspool over there that people are like, Oh, those guys are this. It's like, nah, if it just comes direct to people, everybody's going to open the door and help you out. So, um, that's what's super cool. Um, it's honestly been that way since I got, that's why I got involved. That's what really was like, opened my mind up to pursuing this, you know, cause it, there was no general direction. All I knew was people in it are rad and they all enjoy it. And they're all rad because of that, you know? So it, it, it was really uh, all couldn't help, but go all in on jet skis. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about the backflip and there, there's some parallels. I, I, I see in jet skiing, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's almost like, Freestyle motocross. Freestyle motocross first came out and guys were doing, you know, knack knacks and some stuff like that, Superman's. Yeah. And then the backflip came into play and it changed the game. And then immediately a bunch of people fell out because they're like, I don't want to go upside down, things like that. But I feel like jet skiing, like you said, when it first came out, freestyle was there. there it, it was just kind of there. And then the backflip came into play. And I feel like it's kind of changed everything. And I see what you guys are doing now with 540s and things like that. I'm like, this is just nuts, you know? Right. So, hundred percent barrier to entry again, um, with jet skis now. So you start with like a 445, 50 Yamaha, super jet, any standup SXR 1500, like you name it, you get on these, you have a solid base of a jet ski. Now, can they backflip? That's what everybody asks. They see the videos. They don't understand the, the niche, uh, nuance of it per se. Look at it in the sense of like, um, more or less like a trials bike guy versus your standard, go get a, uh, Kawasaki 450. Yeah. Um, can it backflip? Sure. Under certain circumstances, one is just going to be able to backflip off of a, uh, parking curb <laughs> or a stump. Uh, one of them is going to need a big freestyle motocross ramp. They're both capable of it, but it takes a very certain circumstances to do so. Nonetheless, the rider, um, now barrier to entry on that. You got to have those factors. So for jet skis, I always tell people, yeah, Hey, look, a stock jet ski, uh, stand up can can backflip in the ocean off a good wave been there done that it's not an easy thing it's a big learning curve but you can do it that's your barrier to entry that's what i liked about free ride now for freestyle on flat water these are very purpose-built niche watercraft and unfortunately it is a it is a pay-to-play kind of deal because the stakes are so high you are trying to generate lift and um you have, you have the engine power and the performance of the jet ski combined with technique. And unfortunately, if you don't have the, the bike or the, the equipment, uh, it's very hard to build on that technique uh, and get that reward of that result. So um, it's pretty tricky nowadays. Um, these watercraft range anywhere from used. They're like 22 to, you know, high mid to 22 to $30,000 brand new. You're looking anywhere from 
34 to 38,000 for, you know, a flat water. Um, and that's a very reliable runs on pump gas, um, stock charging electronics. So you're not dealing with some crazy ignition and they're really fun. And there's a lot of customers that I, that I Taylor has built a jet ski and I've gone and trained them or they've come to Havasu to test ride it. And I've given them a lesson and they've done really well and they build their skill up. But man, the backflip is just the, it's the, it's the pinnacle. Everyone wants to do it is trust me. I get it. I want I was there too, but it took a while, but you have to unpack what your expectations are, what your budget is and how you want to go about doing it. Yeah. Well, and I know like you've taught your wife to backflip. She's phenomenal. Um, yeah, you know, I know like a good time. Yeah. Well, and I know like you've trained a few, what was it? I think street Mike Tommy, didn't he try and fire off one? Like, um, I don't know. There's a video of Tommy tried to backflip a jet ski at one point. It didn't end so well, but I give him credit because he, yeah. he was no, that was that was super last minute and rushed. We were over at um the Wild Horse Crazy or Wild Horse Pass for Nitro Rallycross. He was doing Tommy's uh tailgate. And so we're yeah, dude, let's let's get you to do a backflip. Now I thought we'd have like a well, we were supposed to have a 45 minute segment, but Mr. Um always working on his equipment guy here um decided that uh he's gonna have a brand new ignition he didn't finalize and so i chewed through some starting parts uh right before we we're about to film so i had to quickly patch that up that set us back 45 minutes but then when we cameras came we were like hey you got five minutes let's go so okay tommy my jet ski is very short and very hard to ride he tries to go ride it no chance in hell we got four minutes now so i uh have my buddy jackson who is my water safety guy we basically do like a junior start hold for him where we both picked up both sides of the bond line, had him kick into the footholds, which holds you in, um, get him basically get the ski started out of the water. And he's like, ready, we have it nice and level. And we basically shuck him into the water. And I say, Tommy, as soon as you hit that water, you blip it once, grab the trim lever, which makes the steering nozzle go up and you rip that throttle, dude, you're going to do that backflip. And sure as hell, man, he at least got inverted and try. He got he landed a little to the side, but man, it's uh, it's been a journey getting to be able to train people because I've done all sorts of circumstances from people who had just raw natural talent to people who were so outside of the spectrum who have never even ridden a stand up before, and then getting them to uh, do the backflip on one of my jet skis has been really really fun to do. It's really yeah. stressful, but really fun. <laughs> Because everybody learns differently. Yeah. Ooh, Tommy, I and Tommy and I are good friends. We talk all the time. Um, had he ever actually ridden a stand up or was he very good at a stand up before that? No, no. Tommy, Tommy could ride a stand up. He, oh, he's he actually, okay. he's, he's pretty decent. No, he spent some time and I'm not, he's by all stretch, like he's not like an expert, but he's had some time. He's put his cheeks around uh, a couple of stand ups in his day. So um, he's super capable. But again, when you ride one of these, it, they're really light. They want the handle pull, like the ski wants to, it wants to backflip. So it wants to ride like a slippery banana. And if you're not used to this, it is such a radical change from jumping on a Yamaha Superjet or an SXR um, and jump into one of these. It's just a different approach. And unfortunately to unpack that within three minutes or less with the cameras rolling is a little bit tricky. Yeah. So well, Tommy did, great. Tommy did great. Well, just, uh, just your SXR, like you and I both have SXR 1500s or the 160s, I guess they're called. Um, yep. But I, I, mine's totally stock. Same year, same everything. Yours just has a handle pull on it. And yep. yeah, I think different bars than that. Just the difference in ride on yours versus the one I've got. Like, I didn't realize just a handle pull would make that big of a difference. I went, holy crap, this thing corners so much easier. Well, it's all, you know, nuance. Same, or it's all relative to the sport like a, a stock utv they're yeah. great but once you put you know better than i ever will what a handful of certain like somebody said hey i just bought this off the showroom floor what are the three four things i can do to this do to this to get more handling or more top end or more stability um you could just boom 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 like no no question whatsoever you just bought it these are the first things you get Jet skis are no different, you know, standups are no different. So that's where, you know, I put the handlebar on a standup. You get your handlebar placement, your, your body position in a much better place because these new handle poles are telescopic. So you can adjust it. A hydro turf kit, this turf that comes on these skis are very, very basic and flat. This, you now have a tapered kick wedge. The ski accelerates like a rocket. 
these 1500s are so damn powerful. Um, when you're like a surfboard, if you don't have that do not pass kind of in the back of the kicktail and let your heel know that, hey, buddy, you're at the, the edge here, but you can push against me and I'm not going anywhere. That's a big game changer when you're accelerating through corners. So these two simple mods and an intake grate to help keep the ski planted. Other than that, keeping it stock, I mean, you felt it the most. It was a night and day difference, wasn't it? It was just complete difference. I'm like, holy crap. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it's it, it's all relative to you know what your expectations are and what you want to do. But this this a lot of the times I spend just get, getting people to spend a couple you know whether it's a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks on a couple of things and then they're just smiling the whole rest of the summer because they're not fighting these uh, these issues um, as far as handling and kind of like comp overcompensating with their body weight. You know you are riding a powered water ski, so it needs to be suited for your height weight and um and your riding style so uh let's talk a little bit because in the past uh past year i guess even six eight months like you've had some pretty big banger opportunities i know one um you know uh you were with you know travis pastrana in uh, the jim Connor video i know you did uh recoil uh with bj baldwin made an appearance in there i mean you've started kind of bouncing around getting some pretty big opportunities You're talking about being at mid-america and uh you know going out there this uh here in a few weeks uh you know it's kind of uh pretty wild the way you know i feel like people look at jet skiing now and you're the first guy they think of mark gomez you know here's the guy that's in these videos and things like that you know i feel like uh kind of become that guy dude that's a good thing thank you thank you i don't you know yeah sometimes being that guy isn't the right thing to do but i don't mind it in this circumstance because it's uh what i set out to do as a young kid just just loving what i do so the more i i really genuinely do love that moment when um <laughs> you know with jim Connor especially that was such a rad opportunity that when i'm in that pond um that they built and travis is coming head on at 115 miles an hour in the family huckster it's like in that moment i just had to tell myself i'm like this is where you are because you love to do what you do and it was you know on top of all the stress and the crazy crap that had been going on during that shoot but just taking a moment to be like i'm here because i just simply enjoy jet skiing like the core foundation of it is is pretty rad so um yeah jim Connor, um getting to work with bj on that we did a little christmas special that was pretty fun didn't really get a jet ski in it um wanted to throw it in his pool but it didn't work out time wise um but but just a lot of fun opportunities to go. I got to jump over Bucky Lasik last year. Um, uh, still waiting for that footage to come out, but that was pretty fun. Um, done a handful of things. That's uh, you got to do a movie for Larry Rippen Kroger. Um, stunt doubling a couple of people for music videos. Stunt coordinating a music video uh, for some jet ski action. Been fun because again, it all just comes down to just being directly involved and just being a guy that's doesn't happen all the time, but if it's jet ski related, I'm pretty thrilled when I get the phone call. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, that being said, like you, you're talking about backflipping a BJ's pool. I, I laugh because how deep, uh, well, I want to talk about like, I know there's a video from you, I think it was out front of Kokomo's things like that. Mm -hmm. You have talked about how small of a pool you can do, but that couldn't have been very deep or big the one you did in Jim Connor, how, you know, that pond that they built for that. That pond wasn't actually too bad. Um, I've got some BTS footage that's on my Instagram. Um, I was able to do like a full setup wake, which takes at least about, um, let's just say I need 20 by 30, 20 feet by 30 feet to, that's like minimum, uh, because I'm basically making a horseshoe wake, like a double up on a boat wake, then coming in between it. And as those two wakes come together, you thread the needle and right when that wake kind of pops, that's the wake that, you know, you, yields you a much bigger jump than just going off of uh, horsepower alone. So I was able to do that in that pond. It was ranged anywhere from five to eight feet in the center um, because just the situationally how they had to dig it in the middle of an airfield um, and the water was all brown and, you know, there's no visibility whatsoever. So super spooky. Um, but yeah, that was pretty, that was tight, but not super tight. I was just more tight because I was jump trying to jump big for the for the film <laughs> so i was always kind of landing a little off my mark um now the small swimming pool i've done was 10 specifically here in havasu a friend of mine monty he had just built a swimming pool it's 10 by 20 feet 
And I would say it was like more like 18 feet because two feet of it was like consumed by like a, one of those little like umbrella kind of tables that you can like oh, nuzzle yeah. into with some friends, like a little round table. Um, we used every square inch of that thing because I actually got the jet pump. There's a video that you could probably pull up here. Um, it was the worst decision I've made. Uh, at that point, I realized that this is, I pushed it too far. Um, we did it for a Jet Pilot USA catalog shoot a couple of years ago where um, I had Taylor and Mondi. They were holding my jet ski. Again, same thing we did with uh, Street Bike Tommy. Race start where I'm kicked into the jet ski, got it fired up, and they're holding it. I'm getting water through the pump. I make sure everything's like solid. There's no hiccup happening. And I'm just like, take a breath, start it up, and then I'm getting it warmed up. And I go, okay, go. And they, I don't even, I said go just for myself mostly because once I rip the throttle, it's out of their hands jump into a 180 basically almost touching the other end of the pool just from that initial 180 jump landing doing the flip compensating for the direction i came in at landing and as soon as i landed i turned the jet ski off and as it surfaced it rolled right back into their hands that they just released from so that was like nope i'm good that's good you know it, unless it's a very, uh, nope 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 no hot tubs i mean i i do want to jump out on a hot tub i got some i got some ideas coming up but um yeah just really really that was like probably the furthest i pushed it um but there have been some really rad opportunities i mean uh there's a place in palm springs that i get to perform at from time to time called zenyara and they've got a massive man-made lake that is also then connected to a um and an infinity pool. Now the infinity pool is about a foot and a half to two foot step up um, with a six foot gap because they're both infinity edges. So when they're cranking and you've got a lot of disturbance in the water, like you don't see that gap, but it is there. You know, it, the lake drops off the filter and the pool drops off the filter. So I've got to step up to transition into the swimming pool, do a backflip, entertain the guests in the pool. And then I get to do like a barrel roll out and then land back in the lake and continue to rip. It's just like, if I would have known that that was something I got to do uh, as a job, you know, nonetheless, and get to entertain guests, like, I don't know. I don't know if I could have convinced myself of that. So that was just, just so damn fun. So damn cool. Yeah, that's, well, it's funny. I, I think, you know, you've, you've done uh you know i've i've watched most of your videos with some of the tight flips like there's only one other guy i've ever seen that's doing anything remotely close and i think he's in europe maybe i um i saw something and he's doing some really tight stuff in pools maybe not quite as small as you but i think there's one other guy i've seen that i feel like you're in pretty damn elite company with what you're doing yeah. there's a handful of riders i mean any any pro riders you're going to be able to throw them in a swim i'm by all stretch i'm not the first guy to be in a swimming pool especially in Kokomo's and Havasu, it kind of actually used to be a rite of passage thing. Like when you yeah. won the world finals or ah, I wasn't the world finals. It was actually like a local regional freestyle event that we had that kind of made it a thing for the first like two or three years it happened. Uh, and then, you know, the pool kind of wore itself out, you know, um, and guys that got in it kind of got a wake up call like, Oh my God. Like, yeah, just cause you can ride. Like most people don't put themselves into a small little sandbox um, with concrete around them. To, to practice riding, you know, especially with a bunch of belligerent people with a bunch of drinks around screaming and egg and yawn, um, telling you to play free bird and stuff. So, um, <laughs> yeah. you the free bird in the video that, <laughs> Oh yeah. No, well, I mean like do a backflip. It's just like, that's our, that's the, you holding a guitar, uh, with a jet ski, you know, it's like, <laughs> it, it's just, it's classic. It happens every time, but Hey, look, that's, we're here to entertain. So, um, yes, there's a couple guys that can do it. I'm by all means, I'm not the only guy who can. However, I have made myself a career so far based on, you know, if you take it seriously and you want to have an event, you know, with insurance and um, having a bunch of guests and not having an incident, I'm your guy that goes in there and I try to make sure I do tons of research. I take it very seriously. I do measurements. I, you know, talk to the guests. I make sure certain guests aren't getting you know, the, the set isn't getting disturbed and I'm more mindful of the entire surroundings of the event, not just the stunt alone. So I tend to um, earn more jobs that way just because it's it's really a profession, a very niche profession. But I, I take it very seriously. Yeah. So I know uh, you've got here, I think this next week, you're heading to Mid-America, right? You got some stuff going on there. They've got the, the big visions. Yeah, events. I yeah know we're, going, we're going we're going to Jay, Oklahoma. It's uh, Nitro Rallycross. It's really exciting. Um 
Jason and um, Jason there that who owns the the complex yeah. has just been making dreams come true. That's I believe part of the reason why they're calling it visions. It's a big vision of uh, at least uh, again for Travis and a lot of the Nitro Rallycross guys. The the course that they've been building is just mind boggling. Um, so it's gonna be really awesome to see. I think they have the mostly two. They're just really wrapping their arms around um, the community as well as far as like spectator wise, like. You can come, you can camp there, you can, um, again, I'm speaking uh, kind of from things I've heard and seen lightly, I'm going to go experience it, but it really seems like they've gone above and beyond to make and continue to build the experience for your motorsport outdoor racing enthusiasts to not only for yourself to have a good time racing, but for your family to come and just have all kinds of rad stuff to do and really enjoy your weekend out in Oklahoma. Yeah. And I, uh, I unfortunately haven't been out there, but, uh, um just i've always had conflicts or something like that but i know what they've been building out there here's pretty insane i know my buddy jt taylor is uh highly involved out there and making stuff happen and it's i i wish i was going next week it's uh kind of a mm -hmm. bummer just, yeah like you said i think they're and everything i hear like they're their plan it's they're not stopping either you know i think the next two to three years it's going to be yeah really a destination for for power sports people it is. And there's like, there's definitely like, I'm scratching the surface with what I'm doing with them right now. I mean, there's some, I just kind of came up with some ideas and um, they were like, Oh, let, let's, let's work on that. Like, Whoa. Okay. This is kind of like, again, like this is kind of a dream I had, you know, as far as like freestyle and kind of events. And they're like, no, that's rad. Let's, let's start working on it. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> but first let's do the show. So there's going to be some more involvement uh, over time. I'm not going to give it a time stamp. It's going to, when it's right, it's going to happen. I know Travis has been working with them for a while, and they made a lot of headway very quickly. So um, I'm excited to see what happens in the future. They're really good crew guys there. Um, uh, Matt's been taking really good – Matt Edmonds has been taking really good care of me over there. Um, really looking forward to that. So, um, yeah, the future is going to be pretty rad over at Mid-America Outdoor, and I'm looking forward to it. So on top of that, I think I'll be doing, like, a boats, brews, and barbecue event uh, in Oklahoma in September – uh, for them. And then we've actually got a really big high profile event happening in Lake Havasu um, towards the end of uh, October that is still in the works, but uh, pretty exciting stuff with those guys. They're, they're, they're starting to tear up a lot of, uh, start, starting to shake up the industry a bit with some, some events. Yeah. Well, in that, you know, I know there's some, actually some big stuff happening in Havasu in the month of October. Um, you know, not world finals and then a bunch of we other got stuff. we got all kinds of world finals yeah. happening this yeah, year. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be <laughs> out in October for Lake Havasu. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I'm just glad I live here. That's, yeah, that's the right. biggest thing. That's me. Well, it's like I'm 30 minutes from Havasu, so it's like I feel like I yeah. live there too. I'm there a few times a week sometimes. But yeah. uh before we let you go, dude, I gotta ask the 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 jet ski video game in the background, you can barely oh. see it. Barely um, see it. It's, it's you can barely there. see it. There's, uh, I got some videos up on my social media. Yeah, you said you set a high score on it. You, you're right, dude. I did not set a high score. On it. <laughs> that was horrible. I was gonna say, has there ever been any parties at the house where you guys get you start drinking and you're like, all right, we gotta we we gotta see who can set the high score. Well, we've had a few. Yeah, unfortunately, the 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 barrier to entry on it's pretty pretty rough. You gotta. You got to learn how to play the the very at the time realistic Japanese video game uh, with stand up <laughs> jet skis. So not a ton of people. Sometimes we get some competitive people that are like put in the reps and they can set a high score. But um, uh, this is kind of much. Excuse me. It's in my garage. So I spent a handful of time on it. Uh, I'm not saying I'm the best at it, but um, there's still some high scores I still haven't beat that this computer system comes with. So <laughs> I don't know how they're doing it. But um, no, it's yeah. super fun. Just kind of cool, man. I mean, I, I remember playing that jet ski game at like State Line um, in Prim on the way to go see like my aunt in Vegas. And um, and it's just like the fact that that's in my garage now. And I, ironically enough, it came from Oklahoma. A buddy of mine was selling it and uh, my wife bought it for me for my birthday. But then I just had to pay to quite a hefty price. But I got it. You shipped out here and it's been in my garage ever since. And it's just kind of a you know, I don't think I'll ever get rid of it. It's just such a nostalgic, cool thing to have. If you're going to have a, if you're an old dude that has like an off-road pinball machine, that's cool. But if you're a jet skier and you have a jet ski video game, nonetheless a stand-up, that's pretty rad. So I think we'll have it for life. Yeah. Well, it's funny too. Like you said, it's, it's not easy. Like you've got to really, <laughs> no. things like that. It's like, 
I yeah. feel like those high scores that you say are unattainable is probably Katamori that ended up setting those way back when or something like that. I, I think it is Joe Guacamole, actually, now, <laughs> you, now that you mention it. It was probably Yeah. Him. But, man, speaking of Kawasaki, they're just such, they're such a breath of fresh air. I mean, Kawasaki has been the OG in the game, as you know, for – they were the original jet ski. They are jet ski. Jet ski, the brand. A lot of people, little notion that most people understand is like, Sea-Doo is a Sea-Doo that's like Bombardier made Sea-Doo. Kawasaki made the jet ski. Yamaha's Wave Runner. Now, Kawasaki, um, you know, honestly, through my whole career, I haven't got a lot of love from manufacturers, specifically like Yamaha, I did a lot with. And it's still to this day, have a lot of Yamaha based equipment with all the freestyle stuff. But Kawasaki coming in and uh, working with you, uh, with you and myself and doing more with us on a recreational base. Like they love, they genuinely love the lifestyle aspect of jet skiing and they support that. It's not just about the competition aspect, which is really, again, just a breath of fresh air where we can go out and just have fun. And it's all about good times. And I'm really glad that I'm a part of that. You're a part of it. And we're able to go do some fun things like we did last weekend. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what's kind of cool. You know, a lot of companies get so involved in the competition and in competition still, it's not going anywhere. And it's, it's a big thing. Yeah. You know, we see what Kawasaki does and, you know, and Supercross and that they want to win races. But I think like with you and I, it's like, yeah, go out and have a good time. And I love that, you know, they've got me doing some jet ski stuff. They gave you a UTV and they had you, you know, riding a KRX. So it's like, they're, they're yeah. doing this crossover thing and they're like, just go out and have fun. That was their thing. You know, we don't care if you compete, just go out and have fun and just share the stoke, you know? And it's like, it's been, like you said, a complete breath of fresh air for me because I don't really feel the pressure like I did before. It's just go out and make cool content and show people what I'm doing in their machines. Yeah, exactly. So that's, um, yeah, I couldn't say enough nice things about Kawasaki and the whole team there. They've been, um, hope to see you out on some more, you know, if we can get blessed with your, uh, with your good schedule and get you to come out on some of these fun rides that we, uh, that we get invited to the media rides that just be great to have you out on a couple more of them. Cause man, they are fun. Yeah. That's the same thing. Like with that, I've done a lot of the side-by-side -side stuff and things like that with them and some of the rides I need to get you, uh, get you out on some of those. So, Oh, I'm, I'm super down. My wife and I, um, we really enjoyed it. And I feel like Ricky Bobby when I'm in one of those, unfortunately, I think I got a little too hard in the sauce and, um, met the transfer case or the kind of punched the trans the transmission case with, uh, on one of the trails out here, just bottomed out a little too hard. Um, it Havasu is treacherous with all the boulders out here, um, especially the trails getting eaten up the way they do with how many people are out enjoying it. Um, it that was kind of a wake up call. Yeah, it's you know it's thing around Parker and Parker at least with all the washes mm -hmm. as a way of riding itself. We get a mm -hmm. really heavy rain and then everything kind of smooths out. But yeah, kind of hit the reset rain. button. Yeah, but if you don't have rain for a while, oh boy, it's. Uh, it's not fun. You know, park is just like have a suit. There's just thousands of people any given weekend just beat yep. up the same trails, you know? Oh yeah. And it's really, it was really interesting getting, uh, I can't wait to the season starts up again. We want to get, um, we want to get some better equipment as far as like the, you know, the full face helmets with the air system, keep the dust out. That really kind of tore Kaylee and I up. We're actually, we, I think we borderline got, um, what is that dust, um, fever that you get? Dolly fever. Dolly fever. Dolly fever. I think we got a mild portion of that because we went out for like a six to no, no kidding, like a six to seven hour day that we were like mid pack with some friends and we we're just getting after it. And man, we were, I got a sinus infection weeks later. Like, I just don't think Kaylee and I were right for quite some time after that. So we definitely want to get some of the right gear um, to further enjoy it. But man, going out back here, this, this desert is so much bigger than, um, you see from the highway or the water it's crazy yeah there's there's lots of cool stuff we'll definitely have to schedule some rides uh this winter but uh man it's uh it's been fun to finally knock this one out mark i know you and i've been talking about it for a better part of a year so fine yeah finally kind of kind of catch up and and uh you know and talk a little no nah, man we'll do it again and uh there's definitely some events some more things that are going to pop up to talk about uh, if you guys want to find what I'm doing, hit me up on Instagram directly at Mark Gomez 137. I do do backflip trainings. I do regular riding trainings. I just in general, I'm here to help people out. Um, it's a niche business, but I'm here to help you enjoy your ride. Um, other than that, follow me on Instagram to see where I'm going to be at for competitions. I try to promote where I'm going a week of. Um, if you have any questions, reach out. 
as always, um, listen to Jim here in the radio show and keep up with what I'm doing and what everybody else is doing on, uh, in the off-road space. And I know I'm going to be, uh, here and see what, uh, what you're up to next, Jimmy. Oh man, we got, uh, we got a fun project that I haven't really been public with yet, but we're a couple weeks out from, uh, filming and launching this thing. And, uh, it's definitely Kawasaki based and, uh, Does I guess it gonna... have four doors. It's got four doors, yeah, Yay. and a supercharger. I'll just leave it at that. So. Okay, okay, okay. Well, why don't you, why don't you, you stop by with that gremlin uh, as soon as you got it done. Will you? We will. Yeah, we will. It's plenty, plenty of room. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again for having me, guys. And uh, as always, if you have any questions, just reach out. Yeah, we'll get uh, we'll get Mark's stuff. Uh, if you're still tuning in, uh, check out the links down below. And uh, yeah, we've got uh, his YouTube channels, Instagram, and all the good stuff right down there. So uh, click that, give him a follow, and we'll be back after this on the Gentle Tires Jim Beaver Show with Good Times by Kawasaki. <laughs>